Hello everyone, welcome to our lecture for Key Concept 5.1, which will focus primarily on the whole idea of manifest destiny. So I'm going to give you a second, if you want, you can go ahead and pause it, but you can go ahead and read um, what the College Board has put out there as far as what they want you to know for this concept. So feel free to pause it, read it uh, right now. And you'll also notice in the lower right hand corner there is a link to this Google presentation. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you want a copy of the presentation and the speaker notes that I have for this lecture, feel free to go ahead and open up that document. You can even make a copy of it yourself um, and make changes to it. So let's go ahead and get started. So this will be the graphic organizer that kind of runs our discussion today on Manifest Destiny. Okay, so let's go ahead and pretty much check it out here. Okay, so there's basically two major concepts. Um, we have this. Uh, we have this belief in the cultural and racial superiority of America that's going to push the United States uh, into a pretty aggressive foreign policy on the American continents. Okay, so we are going to see obviously the war with Mexico and the acquisition of Oregon country as being the result of that. Okay. Um, we also are going to see that America very much wants to have access to Asian markets, and that's also going to push America for the acquisition of those lands so that we can have, America can have those ports that then can trade with those Asian markets. We're also going to see on the other side here, uh, we're going to see that because we have new national boundaries, because we have uh, massive levels of immigration during this time, and we also see an end to slavery uh, happening at this time as well, we're going to see a lot more conflict um, basically popping up as a result of that. Okay, We're going to see conflict with Native Americans as Americans continue the theme of pushing westward. We're also going to see a lot of anti-immigrant feelings or nativist feelings or xenophobia, whatever you want to call it, towards immigrants, um, especially Irish immigrants and Chinese immigrants in the West. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to get started with President Polk who is one of the more interesting presidents in American history. He's very highly rated by historians. Uh, I would say, however, that most Americans probably never heard of this guy. But anyways, he serves one term in office. Uh, he claims that he's a one-term president, and he basically comes to office with a quote-unquote must list. Uh, there are things that he wants, and once he gets those, it kind of sounds like he's going to be happy. Okay. Uh, the first thing on his must list is he wants California. Okay. Uh, Polk is a very much an aggressive president. He's a firm believer in the idea of manifest destiny, and he is going to want California. Okay, California is going to usher in a new uh, period of economic prosperity for America, he believes, because we'll have access to those Asian markets. So he definitely wants California. Okay, he's going to offer to buy it from Mexico, but if that doesn't work, then he's obviously willing to go a different route. Uh, also at this time, Oregon country is basically jointly occupied by Great Britain and America. And he runs on the campaign slogan of 5440 or fight, uh, basically saying that America wants all of Oregon country. So if we don't get it, we're going to fight. That's his pledge. However, war with Great Britain is probably not a smart idea. And so once he becomes president, there is an agreement made. Um, and you can see on the map there, the red line shows where the country is pretty much split up, uh, Oregon country. Some people feel betrayed by this. Polk sees it as a reasonable thing for him to have done. And he also is going to do the last thing on his, his must list that we're not going to talk a lot about today, is he's going to want to lower tariffs because as a Democrat, Democrats are not fond of tariffs. So Polk's going to usher in this aggressive foreign policy. He's going to have these aggressive goals, Okay. California, obviously, is going to lead to conflict, uh, a military resolution, whereas Oregon country was able to uh, secure a, you know, diplomatic solution, okay? So anyways, let's talk about this whole idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is this idea uh, that is popping up during this time that basically America is kind of that shining light in the world, that God loves America, okay? Okay. Um, that we are, the, we are the best people in the world because we're really the first ones to experiment with large-scale democracy. This whole idea of liberty and equality in America is something that you don't see in other parts of the world. And so Americans think very highly of themselves. Um, and they're able to ignore the uh, hypocrisies in America, like slavery and the treatment of Native Americans, uh, partially because there's a little bit of racist element to this where uh, they feel like 
Protestant white people are essentially racially superior. They are the pure race uh, in America. But basically, Manifest Destiny, they believe that, um, as the painting shows you here, that as the Americans spread westward, uh, they're going to bring the light, and they're going to bring innovation, and they're going to bring... Um, they're going to bring the future to the world. So you can see that in the painting, uh, what this artist shows is on the right, obviously, you see railroads, you see electricity, you see canals and ports and bustling activity and industriousness. And in the West, you see uh, untamed nature. You see Native Americans fleeing from that. You see herds of buffalo. You see a darker horizon. Um, but as America pushes westward, they bring the light. And that was kind of the idea of Manifest Destiny. It very much was this idea of, you know, of American exceptionalism, going back to John Winthrop. Okay? And this was something that many people during this time believed, that America was destined to push westward, um, that that was America's destiny. And so a lot of people back then acted for policies that would promote uh, this idea. Okay? Here's another great painting that shows this whole idea of Manifest Destiny. You see very heroic-looking you know, postures or people are making there as they push westward. Um, you can see some symbolism there in the cross on the right-hand side of Christianity. Uh, you can see women carrying children and people holding guns, but people are kind of looking out to the western horizon, and they're, and they're seeing all this hope. And I, I'm also to assume that because the mountains are on the right, you know, they're most likely looking at the west coast, maybe California. Uh, or, or something like that, but another great painting that kind of captures this whole idea of Manifest Destiny, okay? So anyways, the, the classic example of Manifest Destiny is the Mexican-American War, um, where basically the United States wants this territory. Uh, they want access to these Asian markets. California is very much sought after uh, as a result of some of its great ports like San Francisco and such. So Polk does offer, as I said previously, Polk does offer to buy California, the Mexicans refuse, and so there's a war that starts. The causes of the war are somewhat sketchy, um, but basically most modern-day historians suggest that the United States basically instigated this war um, and, and basically provoked the Mexicans to attack the Americans. And so the war breaks out. Uh, Mexico is completely unprepared to fight a war, um, and, and they get trounced. Uh, the Americans capture Mexico City. Uh, they win all the major battles. They take California with ease. They take New Mexico with ease. Um, and, and there's very little standing in their way. The Mexican armies are not equipped uh, to fight the Americans. And once again, Mexico's a brand new country at this point. Uh, so they need time to, you know, get organized. Very much like how the United States back in the War of 1812. I mean, that was, that was not something that we enjoyed when it was fighting the British. The British... Uh, on occasion, trounce the Americans. They burn down the capital. So uh, I guess there's maybe some parallels there. So anyways, uh, the war is, is is quickly won for the Americans. The Treaty of Hidalgo, Guadalupe, uh, signed in 1848, cedes all that territory in the map there to the United States of America. And obviously that makes up the states of California, Nevada, Utah, and parts of Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. Uh, so it's obviously a very important acquisition for America. Uh, in Mexico, it's known as the dismemberment. So if you were in high school right now in Mexico, you would be learning this as the dismemberment. So an interesting little side point there. So let's move on. Um, there, there is, like I said, during the war, there is intense debate over this war. Uh, many people see it as incredibly unjust. Uh, some of those people include former U.S. General Ulysses S. Grant's. Uh, the great writer Ralph Waldo Emerson, the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, and the, also the future president Abraham Lincoln. So it's important to note that while Manifest Destiny was the craze at this point, that many people in America also saw it as somewhat of an unjust movement, uh, and the actions of people that believed in Manifest Destiny um, met resistance from people like this who thought that this war was not something that uh, America should be involved in. Okay. So anyways, moving on, what we see happening uh, after this war is because we're expanding, because the country's expanding, uh, the whole question of should slavery expand pops up, and we are going to see that that is going to start to create tension. That's going to foreshadow future debate um, in America about the expansion of slavery. 
Immediately after the Mexican session, there is something known as the Wilmot Proviso that is put forth that essentially proposes um, that slavery should be banned in the new territory. Now, because this is proposed in the Senate, the Democrats have the power, or the Southerners, I should say, have the power to basically torpedo this idea, and it does. Uh, but once again, it just kind of foreshadows the future that we're going to have some problems with slavery. Because we now have all this new territory, the idea of slavery uh, expanding is going to create a lot of tension in America. But now that America does have their territory in California, now they're able to basically access these Asian markets that were so sought after. Okay, So we're going to see America aggressively promoting their trade in Asia as a result of that acquisition. Okay, So what we see going on uh, pretty, pretty rapidly here is that the Americans send uh, Commodore Perry uh, to Japan to open up the Japanese markets to American trade. And this is done somewhat through intimidation uh, with the advanced American warships. And Japan at this point is still very isolated with samurai um, still controlling parts of Japan. So Japan is forced to allow Americans to trade. And also Japan decides to westernize and modernize as quickly as possible, which will come back to bite us in the butt, though, when there's the conflict in World War II. But there we can see that because of California, uh, we do have uh, economic access to these Asian markets. Okay, We also see lots of conflict, though, but uh, happening as a result of all these new national boundaries. We also have conflict for massive levels of immigration at this time, and eventually slavery ends during this period as well, and that's also going to create uh, conflict as well. Okay, So let's talk a little bit about the conflict that we see in as a result of immigration. We have large-scale uh, Irish immigration uh, as a result of the potato famine that I'm sure we've all heard of. And so we see uh, high levels of xenophobia, which is um, basically fear of foreigners. Uh, and we see nativist groups gaining traction and gaining power in American politics. There's even a party called the Know Nothing Party. Uh, that arose in the 1850s, uh, and they basically addressed the fears that quote-unquote native-born Americans had uh, a foreign influence. Remember, many of the Irish immigrants that are coming to these lands um, are, are Catholics, okay? And many Americans are Protestants, and Protestants and Catholics don't get along. And, you know, if you go back in American history, people were fleeing Catholicism in Europe. And so this idea that um, Catholicism was kind of coming back to America, uh, very much upset many people. In addition to that, Irish were seen as inferior uh, to the Anglo-Saxon race, and so they were treated very, very poorly. Um, Irish and African Americans in the North competed for jobs. There was tension between those groups. Um, and another thing that really bothered Americans about immigrants was that immigrants were seen as people that didn't want to give up their beliefs and assimilate into American culture. Uh, many groups clung to their culture, uh, and many people felt threatened as a result of that. The other major problem, especially for the Irish uh, that Americans saw, was that because the Irish were so poor, the Irish congregated in major cities on the eastern seaboard in incredibly large numbers. And as a result, the Irish immigrants were able to amass political power within those cities. And that furthered um, the hatred of them. So we do see a lot of conflict popping up as a result of this. Um, so let's kind of move on and look at some cartoons that show this anti-immigrant feeling here. Uh, here's a cartoon. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, and it shows, it shows these gallant Americans here. Um, and they're looking on in fear as um, basically these... I don't know what you would call these, the Pope Gators, I guess. It's obviously the Pope, but then uh, the, the Pope's hat looks like a, a crocodile or an alligator head. Um, and it basically, you're to imply that you know Catholicism is going to attack American values and the American people. So it's a, it's a pretty fascinating cartoon. Uh, we also see, as a result of uh, the acquisition of California, we also see um, a mad rush to California as a result of the gold that is found there. Um, the California Gold Rush basically promotes the migration to California. Uh, people are trying to you know, strike it rich. Most people don't. But California grows as a result of that. 
So people are definitely seeking opportunities in the West. We see whites moving out there. We see African Americans moving out there. We see Asian immigration uh, pushing out into the West. Everyone's rushing out to the West to find these new opportunities. Oops, excuse me. Um, and so we see that happening quite a bit during this time. We see trails popping up, um, allowing people to push further westward. Uh, we see the Mormons settling in Salt Lake City. We see people using the Oregon Trail to get out to um, to get out to Oregon, obviously. And we also see the government promoting these initiatives with things like the Homestead Act of 1862, which pretty much just gave out cheap or free land. Uh, trying to promote Western settlement. So if you were alive at this time during this period in American history, uh, you would have found a lot of opportunities out in the West uh, for you to go out there and try to strike it rich or try to start over. There's all this land and there's no one out there. So you could just at any point in time, things weren't going well for you in the East. You could just start over, start fresh, move out West, get your land and start all over again. So many Americans during this time we're going ahead and trying this, okay? So finally, we, we do obviously know that, well, I, in the previous slide I did say there's not people out there. There are, there are bands of Native Americans left uh, in this area. There's not a lot of them, um, but they are going to attempt to hold on to their land. And so we're going to see conflict with uh, Americans and Native Americans as they butt heads in there. Uh, probably most well-known of the conflicts is the Great Sioux Wars, of the 1870s, uh, culminating in the Battle of Little Bighorn uh, in 1876, where an American regiment, uh, or battalion, I should say, is uh, is is slaughtered um, in that battle. So it was General Custer, obviously. Um, but there is some conflict, obviously, out there. Uh, we see Red Clouds War. We have the Great Sioux War. There's all these conflicts uh, in the plains as Americans push westward. So we're going to stop there for today. Uh, give me feedback if you like, but hopefully this helped.